guitar practice session 10, 15, 24. These are fairly sloppy practice sessions where I practice whatever I think I need to be working on and then give you a recap so you get an idea of what you're getting into. This, of course, being that recap. Hoping the practice sessions help me to generate a routine, verbalize the things that I'm trying to learn to get them in my mind better, possibly provide information to others working on similar things, possibly also providing for feedback if anybody has some ideas on how to get these things in my mind better than what I'm doing. I do think making a presentation as though someone is listening to you is useful even if nobody is because it helps you to kind of verbalize things in a way that you otherwise probably would not so if anybody else wants to make their own practice sessions and use these worksheets i'll try to provide them don't worry about plagiarism or anything like that you can uh, use the worksheets adjust them we do have presentations on how to adjust them or create them in excel which is actually a great excel tool but you don't need to know, know too much uh, to just be able to manipulate them around as we are doing here. So uh, this time we're going to be looking at, by the way, the fretboard will be lined up a little bit different than what you might be used to. I'm trying to get everything going the same way so we can spend all of our mental energy not flipping around the fretboard and seeing, well, here, where's their finger and I'm holding it differently. Where's my finger go related to that finger? No. I'm going to turn it around so that if you were holding the guitar and you pressed it on the screen, we would have the top or heavy string on top, top to bottom, left to right, in the same position as you are orientated behind your guitar. I'm going to flip my guitar around on the screen as well so it looks like I'm left-handed. So once again, the orientation will be the same. So hopefully you can as easily as possible just focus on where the notes are or where the positions are on the fretboard whether looking at the worksheet your fingers or my fingers okay so we're going to be looking once again in the phrygian mode which i call mode number three in position what i call number five which we'll talk about in more detail we're going to get into the idea uh, more i'm trying to focus on the idea of being able to use the absolute numbering system for the modes tying into the major scale which is up here the ionian mode or major scale and then using these absolute mode numbers to get a better idea of the chords that we would then construct no matter what mode we are in in other words a lot of people learn that they're going to be in the major key and they will build a major chord a major triad out of the one four five and then a minor out of the two three and the six problem is if you then go to the phrygian we renumber and so you have a different relative numbering system so we would like to be able to say what are the relative numbering systems here to the relative major so that i can at least say that i can still say that the one four five is major and the 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 two three and six is minor to build my triads even though i'm trying to play in a different mode than in the major mode beyond that though i'd like to start adding the nine the seven nine eleven and thirteen rather than just the one three five and to do that the problem is that normally when we just talk about a chord then uh we we often just say it as it's related to a major or minor key uh instead of which mode we're in which means a chord name doesn't really tell you if it fits in the key you're talking about so what i'm going to start to do for my own purposes is thinking about uh each of these chords that we're making as the mode being the chord meaning if i'm playing the third of the the phrygian that's a g and it's going to be a mixolydian i'm going to call it a mixolydian chord which most people see as a would say well no it's a it's a major chord right well it is a major chord if you play the one three five but if i call it a mixolydian chord i still know it's a major chord because it still has the same one three five but i also know that's the one that has the distinctive seven in it so i'm going to get into the more concepts of that idea so that we can try to play more complex chords in a systematic way to know that they still fit in the same key so we kind of play with that and I also spend a lot of time going through uh, my, I'm trying to see how I can systematically practice all the different variations that we can play on the chords as I practice my intervals through the scales. 
And so I'm working on the best system to do that. So for example, I'm, I'm going to go through each of the notes, like in the middle of the, of the guitar, like up here, for example, and, and try to say, okay, if I had a note on the top, what's my go-to shape that I would make a chord from? Uh, what's my second most favorite shape? And then what are all the different variants I can make a three chord note chord from? What if I was on this note? Now, what would be the, my go-to shape in order to make a chord from that note? What are the variations? Then I go to this one and then I go to this one and we look at each of the strings and say, okay, if that, if I see that as my root, what's my go-to shape that I can build a chord from? And then what's my second favorite shape? And then what are all the variants I can make a three note chord from either a major or minor chord? That's my baseline on which I can then add the seven, nine, 11, and 13. So those are the things that we kind of dive into. I'm still kind of trying to get it down where I can have a practice session that's more kind of efficient to try to think about those things. But the problem is once I start getting into all the variations of, a, of the way you can finger a chord, you could spend all day like on one note, you know, kind of mulling that over. And so I'm trying to balance out how, how much time I want to spend on one note. Also, I kind of cheat, you know, you can kind of look at the worksheet and kind of cheat as to where the related notes are, or you can try to do it by interval, which I'd like to be better at doing, meaning I'm going to try to find all of the related notes available to me by interval, which is a little bit more difficult than just looking at the looking for the colored notes. Right. So but anyway, that's what I work on. Continuing on with what I would call shape number five, looking at what I would call mode number three, that being the Phrygian mode, remembering that we're using an absolute mode numbering system based on the major scale, otherwise known as the Ionian mode. Let's take a look at that major scale Ionian mode where we have the relative positions on the left hand side, one through seven, first through seven, seven notes out of the 12 notes in the musical alphabet. Here are the related notes related to those seven positions in the key of C. Therefore, there's no sharps or flats within them. The next thing that people will typically learn is based on those notes, when can I construct a major chord and when can I construct a minor chord? And we typically learn that the one, four, five are the ones we build a major, major chord from, meaning they have a major third in them. And the two, three, and six, we build a minor chord from, meaning it has a minor third. And the seventh is the funny Locrian or diminished, which has a flat fifth and a minor third within it. Now, beyond that, however, we'd like to get a better idea of what other uh, things can I add to it, such as the seven, nine, 11, and 13. To know that, I think it's easiest to be able to memorize what's the related mode that we're talking about which the numbering system will help us to do even if we're not playing in the key of C because that tells us the intervals that help us to build the chords. That's what I'm going to try to be working on more uh, as we look and go through the Phrygian here. So when we go to the Phrygian then, what I'd like to do is be able to reorder our system. We still have the left-hand side relative positions, the first through the seventh, we still have the same notes in our scale because it's the related Phrygian to the key of C. So we're looking at E Phrygian, which is the related mode to the key of C. But of course, they're in a different order now. And the first is now going to be the first of the Phrygian scale. So the question then is going to be, well, if I'm starting to think about how I'm going to build chords off of all the notes in the Phrygian scale, then how... How do I know? Do, am I going to have to learn the relative positions of each of the different scales? Or am I just going to end up playing all the time in the key of C and trying to play the modes as they're related to the key of C? In other words, I could choose to say I'm going to be playing around the three, around the E, and still think of everything from the perspective of the one being the C. However, you can't really communicate that way. And we can't really think about the the intervals as clearly that way because the intervals are designed to be off of the one of the key. So we would like to put it as the one. And then we have the problem of, well, based on this reframing, the one through seven notes, when do I make a major and when do I make a minor? It would be useful if we can tie back to our Rosetta Stone 
our, our reference point to the key of C. And if I can look at the relative positions to the key of C, then I know that, again, the 1, uh, 4, 5 are major and the 2, 3, and 6 are minor. But beyond that, if I can learn the, the absolute numbering system for the modes themselves, that will also help me to, to construct uh, more complex chords, which I'm looking to spend more time on here. So we're going we're gonna to look at, look at, here's the related modes. Here's the intervals. When we learn the intervals, basically we want to learn the major intervals and then the minor intervals, which is going to be the main minor, the Aeolian mode, and the major is the, is the Ionian mode. And then we compare the minor modes to the minor, main minor, and the major modes to the main major. If we do that, there's only going to be one distinct interval. So in other words, the, the two other major scales that have a major third with, within them are the Lydian and the Locrian, which we can compare to the Ionian, and they're only going to have one distinct different uh, interval within them. We can compare on the minor side, the Dorian and the Phrygian, which we're on now, to the minor mode, and there's only going to be one distinct different interval. In our case, with the Phrygian mode, that distinct different interval is going to be the second, where we have a minor second. You might think that the minor mode should have a minor second, the Aeolian, but it doesn't. It has a major second. So, so the, the Phrygian is even more minor than the main minor. Now, if we look at these intervals, we can see here that we have uh, the perfect first. I'm going to actually look at them uh, over here, uh, where I can where I can be in the the what I would think of as the Phrygian up here on the 12th fret, just to walk through these intervals quickly, and say we have the perfect first, and then we've got the the second is a one note away minor second. That's the funny interval that's different than the main minor, the Aeolian. And then we've got a three note away minor third. That's the same as a normal minor scale. Notice when I look at these shapes, the three up front is what most people don't say, but I'm going to add it because that's telling me the actual distance in half steps. And then when I see it's a third over here, that's because it's the third position. And the fact that it's a minor third means that it's three notes away as opposed to four notes away, which you just kind of have to know but it's easier to repeat it by saying it's a three note away minor third so that you memorize the the steps and then we have the next one is a is a uh, four note away a uh, five note away perfect fourth which is right underneath so five note away perfect fourth so the perfect fourth are the same in the major and the minor the main major and the main minor and in this case in the phrygian and then we have the seven note away perfect fifth that's our power chord so the perfect fifth is the same in the main major, the main minor, and of course in the Phrygian. And then we have the six, which is the uh, minor six. The minor six is going to be distinct. It's the same here in Phrygian as with the minor, of course, different than the major because the, mi the majors and the minor intervals are the ones that are distinct between the main major and the main minor. And then we have the seven, 10 note away, minor seven which is going to be once again distinct and then that goes back to the octave to the one duh, duh, and so okay so that's going to be basically our uh intervals so we're going to be then uh looking in position what i call position number five once again uh and uh, but we're going to be looking at it in the key of the phrygian so we're going to be focusing in on the phrygian within this uh, position. So that's going to be our point of focus. And so we know that this is going to be shape number five. How do I know that's shape number five? Because shape number one, if I say this is shape number one, which a lot of people do generically, then the one behind it, because there's only five shapes, is going to be shape number five. So we have then shape number five. You can also call it a uh, a mixolydian shape because if you played from the first note which we're not going to do we're going to be playing this shape but looking at the phrygian but if you played it from the g through the scale you'd be basically playing a mixolydian uh progression <clears throat> or scale uh you can also call it if i look at the related majors a c and i look there's my c i can build my chord, which is a lean forward chord, which would be an A-shaped chord. So from a cage system, you might call it 
an A shape position, remembering that if you call it that, you have to first see does that position fit into the five note pentatonic shape and then add the other two notes to get the full shape of the seven note shape otherwise it'll fit into more than one shape and you'll mess up your whole <laughs> your whole system right so then so that's going to be that and then the question is well how do i how am i going to get to the e how do i know where the e is in this shape because if i see the shape as mixolydian i know it's going to start on the mixolydian note within it so if I know the mixolydian is the fifth note related to the major scale, and I'm trying to get to the third note related to the major scale, I could just play up the, the key until I get back to the one. So that would be five, six, seven, eight, or one. There's my C. And then I'm gonna say, then I'm here I'm at one, two, three, and there's my E. So that'll bring me to my uh, E over here. Uh, the other way you might do it is by is by shape. You might say, hey, look, where's the box in this shape? There's always going to be this box. There's the box. And in my house analogy, for the house analogy, the C's at the front of the, of the penthouse looking up towards the ocean. And where's the Phrygian? It's the one in the basement because it's the one rocking out with the... We're, we're going to imagine it's, uh, it's, it's doing the rock thing down here with that minor second, distinctive minor second. So that's another way we can find it by shape. Now, as we're talking about shape, remember that I'm breaking the, these five shapes into smaller shapes that we'll see in each of the five shapes. They will always be repeating within the five shapes. You can break it out from the five string guitar instrument, which is five string plus another E is the way I'm thinking of it, into a two string, two string, one string shape, or into a three string, two string shape to try to chunk it down to something memorizable. So the the two string, two string, one string shape is what I call the house analogy, it has a seven note house analogy. Here it is, you have the house and then the double stop. You got the double stop and then the house, although the house has been shifted up because of the, the fault line here. And then you got the two note per string, what I call flat. In this analogy, you you're naturally will be playing a seven note scale, all seven notes. To get down to a pentatonic scale, you remove the upper left of the house and the bottom right of the house, which if you think about those in terms of the modes, the upper left is the Locrian and the bottom right is the Lydian. The two L modes are removed. Then there's the pentatonic shape, which I call the hamburger shape. So if you're thinking about it in terms of the pentatonic, you've got what I call the hamburger, which is split right here. So you can see the full hamburger over here. And then you've got what I call the, the barbell. You only play the outer side of the barbell if you're doing a five note pentatonic. And then you have to enter the inside of the barbell to add the other two notes. The inside being once again, of course, the bottom right of the box, which is the Lydian and the top right of the box, which is the Locrian. And then uh, in the hamburger analogy, we'd have to add the top right of the box over here and then which is the Lydian and then the bottom left, which is the Locrian. All right. Okay. So that's going to be our, our idea. Now, as we go through this, I want to keep on thinking about building chords and focus on that a little bit more. So we're going to go through each of these uh, different positions, look at the interval this way, but then use our interval knowledge to say, okay, well, if I'm on this note, what chord should I build? First, I want to know what the triad is. That's the bass line. And then maybe think about adding some other notes like the 7, 9, 11, and 13. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to go a little bit unconventional here because, because when we name the chords, usually we name the chords based on like a minor or major. And then we talk about basically the 7, 9, 11, and 13 that's being added and whether it's like a sharp or flat and, and so on and so forth in terms of intervals. But that numbering system doesn't really help us to know, like if I'm trying to play in the same key, whether I'm in like the same key. And it makes sense that it wouldn't because you can imagine like to play to, you can imagine playing some, some chord shape that has notes that are not in any of the modes, right? It, it, could, grab, it could grab a random note and you'd need to be able to name that. But for our purposes here, what I would like to be able to say is like, look, I'm playing 
I'm playing a chord that fits into the Phrygian key. And instead, what I'm doing is I'm going to the, like, if I go to the two, if I go to the two note, then I'm playing a two chord. I'd like to just call that like a Phrygian, like a Lydian chord. Why? Because then I have all of the intervals related to the Lydian that I know will still fit into the Phrygian. So, so I'll be in key. I'll be playing all the same notes if I say that, right? If I go to the third and I know that the, the third is Mixolydian, I can say I'm playing, I'm playing the third, which is mode five Mixolydian chord. It's a mode five Mixolydian chord. And you might say, well, you can't call it that because it's a, a Mixolydian is a scale or a mode, not a chord. But obviously the, the idea here is that they're, the, the, the chords are built from the scale, right? So, so by, by naming it the Mixolydian, the related Mixolydian, I can build all of the intervals around that. And I don't have to be thinking, is this, a, is this, is this note in the key or not? I know it's in the key of Phrygian if I'm playing the third, which happens to be the Lixolid Mixolydian mode, and I'm playing all the intervals that are in the Mixolydian mode. So that's, that's why I'm trying to think of it that way. Now, as we go through this, notice what this means that like, we, when we're mapping out this, this is the chords that we can make. This is the one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, and 13. That's just the Mixolydian scale, right? It's all the notes in the Mixolydian scale. It's just that they're out of order because we, we usually skip every other note when we build the scale because that gives less tension. When they're too close together, that's when, that's when the notes get kind of muddy. So all this is is basically saying, saying when I get up to the 7, then I have the 9, which is the equivalent to the 2. When I get up to the, then I have the 11, which is equivalent to the 4, and the 13, which is equivalent to the 6. So if I was looking at this mix, you know, the Mixolydian, this is just the one and then two, three, and then four, and then five, and then six, and then seven, right? So it's just in a little bit of a wonky order. Hopefully that's not too confusing. Now, before I do that, I, I'm also wanting to think that I want to spend more time like thinking about all the different ways that we can make a chord which gets a little bit messy. So that's the first thing I want to do. Like, if I'm going through all these chords, the problem is, like, I'd like to say every note that I hit, one, I'd like to say, what's the, what's the baseline, the chord that I'm going to go to, my go-to chord, right? And then, and then after that, I'd, I'd like to think, well, what are the other alternatives that I can do that can, I can make another variation of that chord based on the same root? And then, and then I'd like to get to, well, what are all the more odd variations that might lend itself to a different voicing and possibly the ability to add more easily like the seven, nine or 11 in more exotic ways possibly, right? And so, and so, and then I'd like to be able to do that on each string. So I'm trying to come up with a systematic way so I'm not just, so my practice is efficient, right? So, so I'd, I'd like to be able to say on each string, what, when, when I play a note on each string, I I I I know what I think is my go-to chord. I know the the easiest ways to play them, uh, the the multiple ways to play them, from that one string, right? So let me see if I so I'm this is I'm still kind of working on this. So let me see if I can kind of try to break this down. Let's first pick a note that's right in the middle, like a G, right? And since that G is a Mixolydian, let's go down and look at it in the key of Mixolydian. So let's look at that G and just say, okay, the reason I'm picking the one in the middle is because I can really break this down into, you know, now I have most more options of how I can build a chord because it's right in the middle. Now, if we think about this just from a chart perspective, what are my, where could I build a chord from? Just like, I'll just try to break this down. I, I have what I would call the most common ways for people to build a lean forward chord meaning the bottom right, I can build a chord starting on that G and try to find a three and a five down here. I, and no, notice I'm also including, I'm always gonna be including the notes right underneath as well in each of the quadrants because it could be right underneath. And then, so that could be in either quadrant, I'm gonna imagine. And then I could go leaning backwards 
and try to find the three and the five leaning backwards, I could I could uh, lean back and up instead of backwards and down and try to find the three and a five uh, up this way, or I can go up and forwards and try to le find a three and a five this way. So that's actually a lot of different of different directions that we can go. And that's really not all either, because then I could imagine that this is in the middle. If it's a three note chord, it has a one, three, five, and this is the one. I can also imagine that I have like a three, I'm gonna say on the top, let's say, and then a five on the bottom. Or I can imagine I have a five on the bottom and a three on the top. So really, so I'm thinking about this in terms of four quadrants around it, and, and this would be the end of the chord, <laughs> right? Versus, and we have that being the middle of the chord, which means you could have it at the top or the bottom. So you really have like four, seven, seven different options you would think kind of available to you. All right, <laughs> that's great. Let's see if we can break. Let's see if that's that's kind of. A, let's see if we can break that down. Now, normally, what's the go-to chord if I'm like in the middle of the fretboard? Like if I'm on these top three strings, my go-to is usually a lean forward chord. So that's going to be in this case uh, a lean forward from here. That would be a D-shaped chord, and I can see this because notice I have I color coded it. That's why I went down to Mixolydian. So I have the the green as the one, the red is is the three, and and the and the and the yellow is the five. So here it is, boom, boom, boom. Now I play it this way because because I'm not good at doing trying to trying to do this this D shape and grab this one, but you could do that if your fingers will work. But obviously you could see it's a D shape because you could see that little D shape up here. So people would usually call that a D shaped G, even though I would play it like kind of like this. And then I'm just muting this E right here. Okay. So that's what, and then what's the second most common way that I would play if the note was on these top three strings I would be playing it back this way. This is what I would call the lean back shape. And so I can play it that way, which would be duh, duh, duh. And that's part of our bar chord because usually I would put my finger on top here and say it's going to be boom. And then put, and if, then you could put your finger here and you have your bar chord. So that's the lean back shape. And then I could pick this one up as well. But Okay, and those are probably the most common from this one, but then I think the next most common shape would be going up and to, to the right, up and to the right. Up, up, I'm going to call it the up, up and away shape because it's going up and away. And then, so we're going to say, and that's going to be now the, now we have boom, boom, boom. <laughs> So it's inverted now. Whoops, I'm on the wrong. So that's pretty not bad. And I could, you know, bar that. Although I might pick up that C by barring it, which means I'm going to get, I'm going to grab that 11. So it's safer to kind of do this and try to mute it. Try to mute everything below it. But whatever. So we have that way. And then it's a little bit more wonky to, like this quadrant, I think is the least common quadrant right so if i go into this quadrant i've got i've got i still got the five above but then the three is like over here so i can't really play that you know at the same time so i've got the five and then the three is right there so i could be like arpeggiate but i can't play those at the same time uh, but so so this so so I mean is there any other B there's no under no other B really I mean there's no other yeah well I have one down here but again that's not in the upper quadrant <laughs> all right so don't get confused don't get confused here okay so now let's imagine that we put the five above and then and and now I want a three below that's when I get this one so now I can say, well, the five is above it and the three is below it. So I could play just these three notes. 
or and that's of course if I added if I added this note that's the same bar chord shape I'm just playing the high hat part of it which is useful to know because sometimes you just need those three notes as you're kind of jamming out. So I could kind of just use, I could play up and down the neck with just those three notes. So in any case, so that's that. And then I could say, well, now I'm looking for a B, the third up top and the fifth down below. So the third up top, we had a third out here. And then the, f and then the fifth down, uh, the fifth down below, that's quite stretchy. I'm not sure that is possible. So we've got like, this is, so that's kind of an interesting shape. Again, you'd have to be like a classical player. I think you got to have your thumb way back on the neck to reach that one. But I could also go here. Here's another third. See, this is why I tried to stay away from the quadrant thing, but I can't because it, here's another third over here. So I have this third and then this fifth. So that's interesting voicing. So I have that available too. Whew, a lot of options, man. Wait a second. Okay, I think I've worn out on that. But when I, so, so again, the normal option would be that it's gonna be my D shape here or my lean back shape like that normally. Uh, okay, cool. <laughs> now, now let's say, let, let's say that's, a, that's in the major shape. Now I could do it for the minor, but let's stick with the major, let's say, let's say I go to the string above it, which is the D. Let's go up to the Dorian to analyze that one. So it's like, okay, well, what if, like, I was on this D? Okay, well, if it's on the top two strings and I was on that D, this is a minor shape. This would be, I'm in the D Dorian, which is a minor. Maybe I should do a major to keep, uh, let's go to, well, the C is gonna be two. I could go to the E, that's gonna be a minor. Ah, let's just do the minor. So now we're in a minor. Deal with it. So now we're going to say it's got a minor third. All right. So now we're going to say we still have the same options, except the upper quadrant is a lot more limited uh, and the upper right quadrant. And we have a lot more space on the bottom quadrants. Right. But I have the same thing. So normally I would have a lean forward shape and this would be a minor shape now. So I'd say, OK, I have my go to shape for most people would be this A minor bar shape looking like that. Boom. And of course I can take that shape apart and see the bits of it because this, I could just play this bit, but that's not focused around this root or I could play just this bit. But again, that's focused around this root and I'm focused up here on this root. So I could say, okay, that's cool. And then, and then I could lean back my lean back shape, which is basically a C minor shape, which would be the third is right there. That's my second most common go-to shape. And that's not too bad to play. A lot of people don't do it, but it's totally doable. You kind of have to mute this one. You might even rest your finger up like this to mute it if you want it. Or you can play that open E if you want on top. That would be adding a nine. I can mute it like that or you could just have more accuracy if you do a finger style and then so then if I go and then going up to the right notice I have the five up here but I I have no nothing else to get to for the third so I can't really go up top I have to go up top and down below so now I can say okay well I have the five up top and I can go to the right to get the third. So I have this one, this one, and this one. So five up top leaning forward to the third or leaning back to the third. 
And then is there a third on this side? I could go way down here. It's kind of like a bar chord, really. But I'm gonna go down to this third. So I could basically... Wait, it's down here. I'm trying to mute all the other strings except for these top two. I could play them, uh, but then I'm but then I'm playing. Uh, then I'm I'm throwing in a G, which would be an eleven, and a C, which would be a seven. If I just barred it, I'd have to play all that. Which you might be perceiving more as an A chord since the A's off top, but I'm looking at it as a as a D. Anyway, okay, so that's interesting. Uh, then, uh, I do I have a third that I can play up here? I have a third way back here. Can I even reach that? The third is the F. I can reach that third. That's kind of a cool two notes that I can reach, but I'm not really going to be able to get to like a fifth doing that. I can arpeggiate it though. Yeah, I could arpeggiate it. Uh, I could reach something with my fingers here. I could reach like this one. What is that? That's a. Uh, that's not my fifth, I'll tell you that. The th I can reach that. There's my C. I'm reaching. Well, it's another F. It's not very helpful. I already have an F. But that could make a little fuller sound. Whew, my hand hurts. Alright. Anyways. So, so we did that one. Okay, so that's basically it there. What if it, if it was on top, all, of, all I can do is lean forward, basically. Let's go to the Aeolian just to check that out. So if I was on top here, I'm on that A. Then of course my go-to would typically be a lean forward shape, which would be the E, E shape, E minor shape, in this case, because it's a minor. That's my go-to shape, and I can I can then lean back and do the lean back form of that shape, which would be there's the third, and there's the fifth. So again, a lot of people don't do that as much, but that's a pretty good, pretty not not too bad to reach go-to shape. Now the other thing. Like, you could get a little wonky since I have so many more strings down here. Like, I could reach that and then grab this third or that fifth. So, one, so now I have more options below here. So, I could do something like that. And now I'm, I'm muting with my finger here, I'm muting all these strings. I could bar them if I wanted to. Uh, by, by, but if I did, I'd grab this one on accident, probably. I could try to get that F. And then mute this one. And that F would be a 13, which is probably a little dissonancy. Anyway, I have that option. And then if I went back and grabbed, I could go back and grab the fifth back here. And then I have the third like that so I could grab the fifth but am I going to be able to grab that third uh that's doubtful eh. I can refinger like that that's a different voicing I and by by the way I'm on the A so I could just ring this open string out too for heart a double A I don't 
do that much. That might be it. Might have to try that. <laughs> Throw that. I actually do some of these I do, but I don't even know exactly what I'm playing because I'm reaching. I'm just kind of reaching around. So it might be so because I'm just basically trying to find what I could reach within the key. But now I, then I want to go back and reconstruct and say, well, what am I actually playing? And can I think about that more systematically now that I'm kind of doing it intuitively? So so there's that one. All right. Let's try to go down to the lower strings. Let's go down to like this C here. Let's go up to C. That's going to be the major. So we're, let's go around this C. So now I'm on the bottom three. So so normally I think people when they when they when they make a chord, they think of the first three strings. Like if I said make an A minor, then you'd probably find oh well there's the A on the top string and then go forward. Or if I said make a D minor, you might go oh the, well there's a D right here and I can make a, a lean forward D here right. So but but if we're, but so most people don't know maybe so much on the bottom strings unless they unless that's where their point of focus has been at least in my experience right so i mean so when you're down here what would be the go-to shape if you're like on the bottom three strings would be the question well i'm on a c major now and so so usually this here if i saw that string the go-to is usually an, to me an a shape right so which is a lean back shape if you want to, I mean, if you want to pick up this C back here, but you don't have to. I usually just think about that C, the C's in the middle. So that's kind of funny because now I'm, when I think about my four quadrants, I'm really thinking of my go-to shape as that C being in the middle. And then I could grab this one up here, which is, you call it, call it a, a, an A shape, or you can call that a G by hitting that high one that's what I would call my that's that's on that string where my go-to shape uh, would typically be and that's funny because it's the middle but let's look at our four quadrants so let's the normal four quadrant I used to go to would be up here right so now I'm gonna say okay well then there would be my fifth right there so if I was here I'd have a fifth the fifth is out a bit more because there's a kink in the tuning so Oops. So I have that, but then the third, I don't have a third because normally if I was up here, here would be my fifth and then the third would be two more strings down. And obviously I don't have two strings down. So that becomes uh, a problem, right? So I could alternate uh, because there's a third right underneath. So it could be like... Right, so I can alternate to this third back here, but that's I don't really have another third to go to. Now, now I could get kind of like wonky with this being in the middle again and try to grab maybe this third up top. So I could be like grabbing that third, which is interesting. People don't see that shape too often. Let's try it this way. I'm trying to mute that top string. I'll mute it with this finger. Even though I could play it out, it's an E, so in this case. So it's kind of an interesting voicing. So if I'm up here, I can be like, oh, there's my third, and then there's my fifth. Throw it, might try to mess with that a little bit. Interesting. Okay, so in any case, uh, I kind of went off of whack here because that's another one where it's in the middle. If I lean, if I lean this way, there's a there's a third right underneath it. So I can say, okay, there there's a third, and if I'm lean, if I'm leaning towards this quadrant, I have this third and this third the third is a major third but it's right underneath which usually looks like a, looks like a minor third but because of the kink in the tuning so i have this this and this so 
that's nice. And that's basically part of the bar chord that I would get from here. Oh, wait a sec, am I in the right spot here? Where, where even am I? I'm not in the right spot. It should be back here, I'm playing. Sorry about that. <laughs> I don't know how long I was in the wrong spot there. Uh, I'm not, I'm not cutting it out though. I, I could, I could, uh, so that's going to be part of the, the C bar chord, which would be this, right? So there's my C bar chord, I mean, my A shaped C bar chord, C chord, which the bottom bit would be this. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, what if, what if I went above here? I've got my G above, and then of course there's my standard, the A below. So that makes sense. I mean, th there's my fifth above. What am I talking? Fifth below, above, and the three below. I could pick up my third above, and I already did that one. I did the third and the fifth, but I could pick up the third and the fifth below down here. So I could try that. So we got boom, boom, and then this E right here. Now what is that? So I'm skipping strings. So I'm trying to mute the strings in between. That's kind of interesting. It's a little bit wonky to finger. But I'm not getting that last note because I'm muting. Am I even getting this right? That's not right. Something's wrong here. I have to go back here. That's harder. Now I can't mute this top string. Okay, uh, let's, let's move on. I, get, I got lost somewhere. Let's go down to this, like this E. So that's gonna be in the Phrygian. No, the E is in, uh, what is the E? Yeah, it's the Phrygian. So if I go to this E, so now I have a lot of space above, of course. So what if, what's my go-to if I'm looking at like an E uh, right here? Uh, th that's gonna be, where's my, I'm right here. So what's gonna be my go-to shape? Well, this is a minor, so it's, it's gonna be an, a minor shape like this. So again, it's kind of wonky because that's like in the middle again. So if I see that, my go-to is usually, if that's my root, I'm going boom. And that's my minor shape. And that's usually if it was a, uh, because if I had this here, I could pick up the full shape that looks like that. I often kind of cheat, I, I, I shorten and just do this, and I look at this as the root. Now if it was a, if it was a E major, that would be your D shape like this. So that, so that's my go-to shape. Okay, and once again, it's a little wonky at the bottom here, because it's kind of like that one's in the middle. It's like the bottom part of the bar shape for the D, for the D bar shape. The, uh, so. Uh, then I could say, okay, well, 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 what's my second best shape here? You, the second best shape on these, I think would be the fifth is usually above it, right? So like if I was on this E, the fifth is usually right above it, but because of the kink in the tuning, it's back on that B. And then, and then the third is going to be right here. So I think that's the most, the second that I should be seeing as the second most best way to see that shape. Even though 
though it's inverted. And then maybe I can even, if I was to play that, I can pull this E over here. This would be like a C minor shape. That's a tough thing to do though. But that's easy to play and I can mute everything around that. So it's probably the number two most common uh, shape. Uh, then, then normally I would think, okay, there's my fifth. So, so if I'm leaning forward, I'm like, okay, well I have a fifth right here, but then I need a third. So the third, I can't go on these two strings because I've already got those down. So there's a third like right above it. So I could be like, boom, boom, boom. Now that's kind of funny because if I, if I put my finger on that C right there, then I'd be playing the 13. And if I barred that, it looks like I'm playing a C now. But I can also think of it as an E with an added 13, or I can remove that C. Play it this way. If you... Okay. Okay. Interesting. All right, let's just do the A at the bottom, which is the minor. So here's the minor, here's the A at the bottom. So if, I, if I'm trying to build something off of that bottom one, then all I can really do is build up, right? <laughs> so right above it, I've got the fifth, and then right above that, across the kink in the tuning, I've got the third. So that's my go-to shape. That's just part of the bar chord, because here's the whole bar chord for the minor. Here. And the bottom bit of that is just, which has the three notes, although it's inverted. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, I have another E over here. So I could play like these three and then grab that E back here. It's harder to do than it looks. And then I've got, there's another E over there. I've got an E up top. So I could be like, boom, boom, and pick that E like there. And again, I could just bar this. That might be easier to do, idiot. All right, there's no need to be rude. All right, anyways, that's a, uh, okay. Let's stop there. So those are, that's my rundown. I'm a little tired actually now. <laughs> I have to stop now. No, we have to go to the Phrygian. All right, let's do a joke first. Do a joke, practice session joke. Okay, let me get some coffee. Ah. You know, Phil keeps telling me, keeps saying like, why, why are you trying to, why are you trying to reinvent the wheel all the time? Why are you trying to reinvent the wheel coming up with your own like names and this? And it's like, dude, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel, Phil. I'm more like making variations on the wheel. 
you know, for different circumstances. I'm like the I'm like the dude who got the who got the schematics for the Ford Model T, and I'm thinking like, you know, if we increased like the size of the wheels on this thing, maybe I could drive it right through the creek, right through the creek, so I don't have to go all the way around the block in order to get to the bar. You know, that's what I'm thinking. I don't, I don't live by the quote, don't reinvent the wheel. I live by the saying, which you may never have heard of, but it's way more profound. A great invention is never fully invented. That's the, that's the quote. Great, great, great inventions are never fully invented. Okay? Okay? They're a work in progress all the time, man. I'm over here helping out the wheel inventor. Not, I'm not trying to, trying to replace what he's doing over there. I'm, I'm, I'm making the invention span larger territory, man. Tell me, to, tell me not to reinvent the wheel. I'll, re, I'll reinvent whatever I want to reinvent. You, you know what you need? You need to, you need to like reinvent a bath for crying out loud. Why? Because you stink, man. You need, to, you need to reinvent the bath. Maybe then people will listen to your reinvention comments anyways let's get back to it all right let's just do a couple of these we're going to try to go from the e down here around the horn to the e up top so we're in position five i'm looking at this e if i was to count this out uh wait a second i'm looking at this e if i was to count this out it would be one two three four and then that repeats up top three four five six seven eight so there it is so we're gonna be down here we're like okay one two three four three four five six seven eight all right so then let's go from the one to the two so the one to the two is a uh that's where the phrygian has its half step so that's a one note away minor second and uh, the inverse is 12 minus 1, which is 11. So if I go from E to F, one note away minor second. From F to E, 11 note away uh, major 7. And we know that the second of the Phrygian is calculated as uh, 3, mode number 3, because Phrygian, if I look at the major scale, is the third mode, which if I start on the Ionian, is two modes down. So three minus two are the number of steps, two, to get from Ionian to Phrygian. So that's why I'm going to say the formula is three minus one is two, plus the mode I'm on or the relative position of two gives me four. And mode number four is Lydian, or in other words, four is the relative position of this note to the major scale, which means I'm going to build a major chord from it because the one, four, five are the ones I build a major chord from. But beyond that, I know it's the Lydian mode. So I can, I'm going to start saying that I'm going to build a Lydian chord. What does it mean to build a Lydian chord? It's just going to be a major chord if I have a triad because the Lydian is a major mode, therefore has a major third in it. But if I go beyond that, I know that the Lydian has a distinctive uh, fourth, which has an augmented fourth. So whenever I go to the fourth, which is the equivalent to a nine, when I'm thinking about chord constructions, I know I have a funny, a funny, kind of a funny one. So, okay, okay, I hear you. Let's, now let's build that. Let's go down to the Lydian down here and check it out. So now we're going to say that if I'm down here <clears throat> on this Lydian, uh, I'm on this F and let's build, let's build around the F. So what would be my go-to chord if I'm building a major triad on that F? Well, it would be my, it would be a, a, a major shape. So it would be my D shape. Whenever I see that, I'm like, okay, I'm going to either make a D major or a D minor. A D major is my, is, is a D major minor shape for my F chord. So I'm like, there it is. Boom. So there's the shape that I would have. Now I could say, okay, I could get more crazy with it and say, and say, well, what else could I build here? Well, I know that if, if I had my, my, my uh, fifth is over here, then I could look for a third and I have like a third maybe up here. 
So now I'm going, now I'm going, dude. So now I'm going, uh, now I'm going, uh, why are you going, uh, because I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, so now I'm here and like, boom. <laughs> actually do I have that right that's kind of easy to do now that I uh, now that I think about it anyways okay what if I picked up the fifth here and then I went backwards to try to find a third I, and the third's gonna be way up there not the most useful thing I do have a third here and a fifth back here so I could be like Let's go back to this third here. That's a reach. I can't get nowhere nowhere else if I do that. But I but I could. Yeah, that's pretty much the reach. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I could go to this third, and then I have a fifth, like up here. That's an interesting way to play it. So I have a, an A and then the C. That's not too hard to finger. Got to do some muting. It's an interesting sound. It's super inverted because this is way higher in pitch and that's the root. I kind of like it though. I kind of like it. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'll play with that. It seems e it's actually pretty easy to finger if you practiced it. Anyway, moving on, moving on. Uh, let's do the next one. Let's go to the third and say now we're on the third. So if I was like, okay, I can go to the third if that's what you want to do. If that's what we want to do here. So there it is, the minor third. That's a three note away minor third from the Phrygian that we're back to. I know that because it's five uh, down here, four, three. To get back here, the inverse is 12 minus three or eight, which would be an eight note away uh, minor six. So going from top to bottom, three note away minor third, bottom to top, eight note away minor six. I also know that the third of the Phrygian is three uh, three, Phrygian three minus one is two plus three gives me five. So it would be the fifth of the relative major, which means I'd make a major chord from it because the one, four, five are the ones we make a major chord from on the major key. And beyond that, I know it's the mixolydian. So I'm going to say that I would make a mixolydian chord. What is a mixolydian chord? Well, if it's just the one, three, five, it's just a major chord. But if you add all the other intervals, it's going to have a distinctive seven uh, to it. It's going to have a minor seven to it. Okay, uh, let's check that out. Let's go down to the mixolydian to look at that in more detail and be like, okay, mixolydian. So now I've got this G down here. G, where's the G, G whiz, Scooby? All right, I'm going to say... If that's my, what's my go-to shape? Well, this is a major now when it was the minor. So the, th the fifth is right above it. That's always the case. And because it's a major now, the third is out here, which is just the bottom part of the bar chord. So that's my go-to shape. Here's the bar chord. Here's the bottom part of the bar chord. And you could bar it off like this. Most people probably do it that way kind of weird I like to do I like to like put my fingers <laughs> specifically on the notes I don't like that bar thing but the bar thing because then I can mute this one above it more easily maybe it's probably a better way to do it so uh, whatever whatever dude anyway <clears throat> so uh, 
so that's the that's going to be this one and then this one i could go here and then like back here which is a little walk walk the donk back to here second fret b no, it's not too hard to play actually because then i can mute these two if I don't mute them, I'm picking up the D and the and the G. I could try not to mute those, and I would get a five, another five, and a one. So I could totally not mute those in this case. But if I wanted to move this shape forward, I can mute them. If I want to make it movable. Still somewhat doable. Highlighting the third in that one, because that's the lowest note. All right, what if I picked up like the fifth up here and then like the third like that? What if I did that? That looks fingerable. <laughs> oh, God. All right, we're going to say this is going to be this. There's the B and the G. That's totally doable. Can play it with this finger even. I just have to not mute that bottom string with my palm like I usually often do. If I put my thumb behind, then I'm gonna hit that top string, which means I'm gonna add an E, which is a 13. I could try to mute it with my pinky, or I could try to mute it with this finger. And it's doable. But then I can't mute the one below it with that finger. Dude! I can mute that one with this finger. If I lean if I lean it down. It's got potential. I actually might toy with that one all right all right let's move on back to the phrygian this is going really slow you're going really slow these days getting older you know things don't move quite as quickly as they they do going slowly but surely keeps getting messing me up it's okay to move slowly, but no buts. No buts. But surely... Okay. Then we're going to say uh, the fourth. So now let's go to this one. So the fourth of the Phrygian is a five note away perfect fourth. I can see that because there's five notes between the strings. The inverse is 12 minus five, which is a seven note away perfect fifth. So bottom to top seven note away perfect fifth i also know that the fourth of mode number three phrygian is three minus one is two because phrygian is two modes away from the ionian if that's my key and then two plus four is six which is the aeolian so or i could say it's six meaning it's the relative sixth position of the major scale which means i would make a minor chord from it because the two three six are the ones i make a minor chord from but beyond that i know it's the aeolian so I'm going to start calling it an Aeolian chord. Isn't that just a minor chord? Well, yes, it is, especially if you only had a 1-3-5. But I know that it's actually got all of the intervals for the minor related to it. That's the key. Uh, I should be, okay, so then, so let's say, uh, let's go down and check it out then in the main minor down here. So that's the one where I can say if I was down here, and I'm like, what would I build from if that was my root on the bottom string right above it? Boom, boom, boom. Bam. All right. So then if I take, let's think about like if I took that as my, like I'm playing these three, what if I wanted to add like my seven to it? Where's the seven, man? Uh, there's one right above it. That's convenient. There's one right there. As a matter of fact, it's a factual matter. So that's cool. And 
and that's of course part of my bar chord that would normally be like this but then I just reveal with the pinky G revealed okay cool enough uh, what else could I do with that man I could add the nine which is equivalent to the the nine is equivalent to the two which is the B so if I'm here I'm looking B so there's one there but that's not really helpful because I've already that means I'd have to remove the third there's a B out here it's a bit of a stretch so that would be on the ninth fret so if I'm grabbing like the A and I'm like I need a B like out here Okay, might have to toy with that. What if I wanted to add like the 11, which is equivalent to the four, uh, then I'd need, I'd need a D. So I'm like, okay, an 11, I need one like up here somewhere. I could just play this whole bar and then I get the seven and the 11. <laughs> I just played that whole bar. That's interesting. I get the A on top, the 7 and the 11. All right, what if I want the 13 then, and then we'll move on. The 13, which is equivalent to the 6, I need an F. So this one right there. So it'd be like, boom, boom. So now you're just cheating. You're not using your intervals. You're just finding you're just finding it on your worksheet. You have to do it with the intervals. Whatever. I'm going to do it. I'll do that later. Not bad either. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the next one. <clears throat> We could do those same two up top, like if I did my G up here, back to the G, now that I'm going around the horn, uh, we could do that. Let's go, that, that's the Mixolydian again. So we looked at that one before, most likely. So that's the one that, of course, my go-to would be the, the this one. And then if I add stuff to it now, let's just, and then my, my second most f common would be, wait a sec, that's not right. I'm on this G, I'm not on the A. That would be an A major, G, this one. And then my, my second most common would be the lean back. And then if I wanted to add stuff to this bar chord, if I'm doing this bar chord and I'm like, I wanna add some, some funk, some pizzazz, get fancy so that people are impressed by stuff. I need to do more fancy stuff. People aren't impressed enough with my, with what I'm doing. It's like, okay, let's just add like the seven. And because this is now, now what am I playing? I'm playing the mixolid. I'm going to call this a mixolydian. Uh, this, this, I'm going to call the mix. It's a mixolid. I'm playing a mixolydian. <laughs> Uh, chord. It's like, well, yeah, but that's just a, that's just a major chord. It's like, yeah, it is, but it happens to be the Mixolydian mode, which is useful because then if I want to reveal the seven, then I know that this is the seven. I'm gonna I'm gonna reveal the Mixolydian seven, which is a minor seven instead of a major seven. So I know that if I so that's nice, and then I can go to the nine which is equivalent to the two and say, is there like an A that I can, I can throw into the mix? And there's one obviously up top. So I could just grab this A 
And then I've, I've still got my G if I could still bar it off. So it's still a minor. But maybe I want to grab, maybe I need to then grab this G. That gets a little bit more tough so that I, so that I, so I still have the root like up here. But if I do that, I'm also revealing the, uh, this one, which is the 11th, which is equivalent to the four, which let's just go back here and say, get rid of that two. I don't, the two, no one wants to hear the two. No one wants to hear the two anyways. Get out of here. We're going to say, like, falls like, boom. And then, and then I was like, I want to move, then I remove my ring finger. Cool. And then what if I want like a 13, which is equivalent to the E, uh, the, the nine. So there's one back here that's a little inconvenient because then I'd have to be like, all right, there's the 13. So then I could still pick up like the, th the five over here, but now I'm missing the third. So I could do that. Or I could try to say, there's the 13 and here's the third right there. I'm muting the other strings, so I could do that. So, but the bottom line is if I have this bar chord, I can do variations on this bar chord by just going boom. Because this is a mixolydian bar chord, mixolydian chord, I know I can lift up my pinky, revealing the F, which is the seven, back to normal. I can pick up my ring, I can pick up my ring finger, revealing going from the D to the C, which is the 11. So that's cool. I can't pick up my this finger, bec and, which I might be able to do if it was, um, right, because I can't go back to here, right? If it was a minor chord, I could go back to there, but not here, and I could, because, and I could also reach up to the two if I wanted to, possibly with my pinky, because that gives me this G, this G is still ringing out, and then, uh, and then I'm revealing the t I'm revealing the C, which is the 11, but also picking up the two. So now I'm reaching up to the A. So if I put that together just in this one shape, hurting I think I'm gonna have to stop there so hopefully I've thoroughly confused everybody I think I'm gonna give up on the Phrygian and move on maybe to the Lydian uh, tomorrow uh, but we'll see <laughs>